This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell, and joining me in the studio today are the Toledo Symphony's music director, Elaine Trudell, the TSO's president and CEO, Zach Vassar. We also have principal second violin and artistic administrator, Merwin Sue. And we have a special guest today, for which I have a fanfare. Let me bring that up. That's your walk-on music. Everybody, please welcome our special guest, Valerie Kantorsky, who is, uh, how would you define your role at Toledo Symphony? You're the principal keyboard or principal piano or... Principal keyboard, I would say. Principal keyboard. Right. Right. Exactly. Especially considering today's subject needs to be keyboard rather than (laughs) piano. Is there a typing contest? (laughs) (laughs) We know that, uh, you know, you're here for a reason. And and we're talking about this concert that's coming up. It's happening on Sunday. It's October 2nd at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Toledo Club. The Tascan, or I should say Tascan, Mm -hmm. if I want to do it in French, Tascan Hubbard harpsichord making its uh, Toledo Symphony debut, yeah? We're, we have a lot of harpsichord-themed stuff going on today, and we'll also have in the classroom with uh, David Dyer, who is also uh, very much in the world of TSO. He's mm-hmm. sort of a harpsichord expert, and we'll hear from him as well. But first, let's talk about this particular harpsichord, the uh, Tascan Hubbard harpsichord. you want to take the lead on that, Zach? Oh, sure. We're really happy to have this added to our stable. You know, we have Steinways on the piano, and now we have basically the Steinway of the harpsichord. Um, This came to us uh, uh, through a a fascinating, uh, wonderful story. And I'll pass this over to Elaine, because you were involved in some of the (laughs) assessments, yeah? Um, But the the harpsichord we had used for many years, uh, let's just say, was, was okay, and I'm, Valerie, you might be able to share a little bit more about <laughs> sure. that. But the um, uh, the the wonderful gift we got came from Craig Whitaker, who uh, runs Craig's Keyboards. He does all of our tuning and keyboard maintenance. Uh, and he, after many years of trying to resuscitate our former harpsichord, uh, he bought us this most wonderful gift, which is uh, the Tascan Aubert piano wow. or uh, harpsichord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We don't want to get those mixed up. Although... Certainly not. They, they look quite a, quite a bit different. Yeah. One is much lighter than the other. <laughs> um, but it's just a beautiful instrument. Um, it, 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 it's, it's beautiful on the outside. It's beautiful on the inside. And you just start to realize that these harpsichords really are works of art. Yeah. And it's just a, a lovely machine. We've, we've used it, honestly, twice before without any fanfare. So this is the debut-ish. Debut-ish, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The, well, it'll be the debut. You know, it's like the old TV uh, commercials uh, they used to put on the network where they were running repeats, and they were like, if you haven't seen it, it's new to you, right? <laughs> Taste it again for the first time. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Valerie, tell me the, the difference between the old harpsichord that you played on and, and this new one, which you've you've already played it, right? Right. I have um, really the, the, the launching uh, unofficial was uh, last December when the symphony performed the Messiah, mm. and it, well, there it was, right in the center. And mm. uh, so it was quite a thrill to be able to play this new beautiful instrument. Yeah, and um, yeah, I was uh, very pleased with it. the uh, The other instrument that we usually relied upon had. Um, uh, pedals, foot pedals, instead of levers, which the Tuscan Hubbard has levers, and um, and there are just more comfortable feelings with uh, with this new harpsichord that we that we have now. Yeah, so. and, and it's transposable, right? You can. It transpo- is that. Yeah. Yes. And, and uh, David Dyer is going to talk about that a little bit later on. But mm-hmm. first, Valerie. One thing that we do with um, newbies to Toledo Symphony Lab is we have them tell their story. And I have, uh, you know, you and I have talked about this, so you sort of know what to expect. I I do have some music for you. Let me bring it up here. There we go. Of course, it's harpsichord music. 
All right, your story, Valerie's story. Take it away. My story. Um, well, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. I didn't see falling snow until I was 18 years old. Um, <laughs> both of my parents uh, were teachers and classical musicians, and uh, my brother and I would uh, fall asleep in, in the in the evening to string quartets being played by by oh. friends of my parents. Mm, wow. Um, so, anyway, yes, I grew up in a musical family. <clears throat> My grandfather was a pianist, or he'd probably call himself a piano player from the Detroit area, and both he and my grandmother were actually uh, vaudeville um, performers Hmm. and uh, ran that vaudeville circuit. She was also a light opera singer as well. And um, so, um, myself, gosh, um, (laughs) um, performing, teaching, what I love to do, um, my sons are also musician, musicians, so that would make them, I guess, fifth generation musicians. Wow. And um, so it, it, it does run in the family. It's hard to take it out. And mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's uh, sort of my story. I'm going to throw out some adjectives with which you describe yourself in your bio on the TSO website. You say that you are a world traveler, a rail rider, <laughs> tree hugger, mountain hugger, cloud interpreter, cat lover, and voracious reader. So see if you can talk about all of those. In the, aye, aye. Aye, aye. In the minute and a half we have left. Yeah. Um, love to travel. I traveled in 49 out of 50 states by the time I was, uh, whatever, a teenager. Um, European travel, loved to do that. Um, what else? A tree hugger? Yes. I, um, I find my, my deepest therapy walking in woods. Mm. And hugging trees. And, yeah. uh, what what and, is a mountain hugger? Um, well, um, I hug any rock that uh, that I might stumble over, <laughs> face down, you know, intimate uh, relationship all of a sudden. <laughs> ah, nice. Yeah, so, nice. yeah. And love. you like cats. That's a, it's a plus in my book right there. Okay. Yay! Yay! Yeah, there Definitely. you go. Definitely. Right, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that sums it up. It's really interesting to hear your story. I mean, that's one of the best stories that we've had, I think, on True. the program. Oh, you really. say that to, that every to guest. all your guests. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, not every guest. Not every guest. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Valerie, I wanted to ask you about the spelling of your name because it, there's like a vowel missing from Valerie. It's Val re, right? Right. Uh, yeah, it's not a missing vowel. <laughs> it's just that other people choose to add a vowel. Ah, there um, you go. Yes. It, I was named um, in memory of, in honor of my, my father's sister, mm-hmm. who was quite a, quite a bit older than he was when his mother died and she became his surrogate mother. Mm. But she spelled it that way as yeah. well. So It's interesting because when I first uh, started typing your name into scripts, I kept thinking, I kept getting the autocorrect, you know, saying it's <laughs> Valerie, not Valerie. Right. But uh, I thought it'd be fun if we each took a vowel out of our name, out of our first name. I'm out. So <laughs> you would be Zika. I'd be ZK. ZK. Yeah, I'd be Bird or something like that. Bird. But now, Elaine, you have you know some choices. You have three yeah. vowels in your 60% first name. 60% well, vowel. Uh, just come Elaine, then. Take the first one out. Yeah, Lane. just Lane. Yeah, Lane. why not? Hey. <laughs> Lane, I'm leaning on the wall right now. What well, do you say, well, Marwin? Well, for me, it's easy. I'm Mr. Wynn. <laughs> <laughs> hey! I, Again, I would say this. Merwin for the win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were approached about this, we had the challenge of Picking a harpsichord from afar during a pandemic, yep. <laughs> which is not an easy thing to do. It's not and like buying a car on, on those websites where you just it, look at it. Some and people are okay with that. But, you know, just like pianos, harpsichords all have their own characters, and maybe even more so given the um, finickiness of the harpsichord. Mm. Yeah. So, Elaine, do you want to tell a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, we had a choice of a few. Well, first of all, we need to find a place. There's a place in Boston where they, they have a lot of a harpsichord and they're very renowned. Uh, but of course, we couldn't travel to go all those places. So, phoned a teacher there who's very uh, 
how do you say, that he knows the place very well. He knows the instruments well, and he's mm. around. So he went to play, and we had a FaceTime. <laughs> of course, you cannot judge the sound with the, the, the phone. <laughs> but we can have a discussion about, you know, you can see how it holds. Well, you can see what it looks like, but that's very, that's that's secondary. Yeah. That doesn't really matter. But uh, the, you can see the ease, you can see, as, and I can have feedback from the player while they're playing. Because if you have a feedback the day after, we musicians, we always normalize everything. We say, oh, it was okay, you know, <laughs> because everything winds up being okay, right? So I, I just want to have, you know, right away, the first feedback, sorry. And and we had that, so I heard him play. Okay, try it. Go sit to the next one. Go sit to this one. And finally, it was between uh, two. And, and, and this one was just very special. I mean, it's interesting because the, the one we didn't pick had all these fancy, uh, Rococo kind of, uh, mm. you know, things yeah. about it. But, uh, cause our, our harpsichord is pretty, um, uh, it's pretty conservative. Like the, the decoration, uh, what it looks like is pretty, uh, there, there's not a lot of things on it, but it's beautiful. Yeah. And finally, you know, we just went with this one. And also it's, we use it in the orchestra. Uh, it's different than if you play recital, and it's different if you play with a baroque group that has uh, very few strings and that play with gut strings. And the, we we try to play in the right style, of course, but we we need an instrument that will kind of do the duty of playing something that blends with more modern instruments, still playing right. the right style, but that blends. And uh, I'm sure Val, you you'll agree. I mean, it, it has some power to it. Yes, you can and play, and uh, with the two claviers. Uh, there's a good difference between the two claviers also. We we played a recital together, Val and I, uh, and we did harpsichord with cello and trombone <laughs> yeah. and uh, with Martha. And we're able to find some fantastic colors. So it's also a good chamber uh, chamber music instrument. So it, yeah. it fit all of this. But it was interesting to do it in a way that normally I would fly there. Uh, you would fly there also, mm-hmm. Val, and we, we, we try this thing together. And see, But now it was just uh, another technology, like we have meetings on Zoom. Now we chose an instrument on FaceTime. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing is you have uh, all of your auditions will be on, on Zoom, oh, right? No, please, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Pass. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I spoke with David Dyer not too long ago, and he um, – gave me a couple of clips that I thought it would be nice to play on the program today. The first is a, a brief history of the harpsichord. Okay, so we can listen to that. I'll leave our mics open so we can ask questions or react. My name is David Dyer. I'm a violinist and sometimes violist with the Toledo Symphony Orchestra. I'm also the orchestra's recorder player. Okay, brief history of the harpsichord. From the beginning, we owe the existence of the harpsichord to military history, believe it or not. The technology for making metal wire goes back to the technology for making chain mail. And I believe that the very earliest harpsichords used uh, iron wire. I guess before we had harpsichords, we had other instruments, zither-type instruments, or what uh, in the Middle Ages they might have called psalteries, which were instruments that were plucked by hand. What turns it into a harpsichord is operating it with a keyboard. So that's, that's what we had for a long time, was harpsichords that were plucking one string. They evolved into longer, larger instruments, from there, we have a kind of branching out of different styles of instruments. Different countries had different musical tastes, and different kinds of harpsichords were built to suit those tastes. And then we move into kind of the Stradivari family of the harpsichord, the, the Flemish Rockers family. Their instruments had a very deep sound. They were also the pioneers of two manual instruments. And what you get to is an instrument like the instrument the Toledo Symphony just uh, recently acquired, which is a copy of a Pascal Tascan instrument. Pascal Tascan, he was a harpsichord maker from Louis XIV through Louis XVI. So he was active for quite a long time, all the way into the 1780s. I mean, people think 
the piano was invented and the harpsichord died. Uh, that was certainly not the case. As a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the first guillotine was made by a harpsichord maker. <laughs> so they, they were still around, around then. They needed somebody who's good at uh, precision work with wood and wire, I suppose. <laughs> so they hired a harpsichord Gosh. maker to make the first one. <clears throat> so, um, for instance, we think of the Baroque period as ending in 1750 or so. Tascan was still building instruments, so uh, obviously the harpsichord was not was not dead at the end of the Baroque period. By the 20th century, when almost nobody was using the harpsichord for any kind of solo playing, many Italian opera houses still had their harpsichords. They, they hadn't gone away. We also have to think about the duties of a harpsichord player, and we can't really divorce the instrument from the musician. Most of what a harpsichordist does is improvise, what we call continual playing. The term continuo means the realization of a bass part in Baroque or any other kind of uh, music, which could be a solo instrument like a cello, it could be a polyphonic instrument like a lute or a harpsichord, or it could be a whole group of instruments. So this was the primary job of a harpsichordist, and this practice of continual playing, of having a keyboard being part of the orchestra, continued for a very, very long time, be it from a, a harpsichord or a piano or, or whatever. Uh, Beethoven's piano concertos, when Beethoven was not playing the solo part, he was playing along with his orchestra. In other words, he was being a continual player. Okay, so now there will be a test. <laughs> a lot of information there from David Dyer, including well done, David. Yeah, wow, in, including man, talking about the the Tascan Hubbard uh, harpsichord that we've been talking about. Merwin, you want to go over a little bit of the the repertoire? Now, there's no guillotines involved in this concert, right? That was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I even have a little oh. guillotine oh, sound no. effect that I added to the. <laughs> I added to the sound. You know what that, that sound effect was? <laughs> Cutting edge. Uh, 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 Cut it <laughs> Okay, Merwin, you're on. Well, I don't want to lose my head now. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, cut I, it out. I yeah. think <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to play with a little guillotine. I mean, it's, it's almost said Halloween. Said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Hey, Billy, want to come over? I got a new guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Merwin, sorry. It's, so it's going to be tricky to remember um, <laughs> what the, you were talking the about. wonderful <laughs> things that David was talking about. But I think <clears throat> what David mentioned is really critical to the way we structured this concert, which is the the roles that the harpsichord has and how many centuries that the harpsichord has been a prominent instrument in music. And I think it tends to be kind of pigeonholed a little bit. And I think mm. we're trying to use this concert to showcase the instrument in many different roles. I think um, we mentioned that it was a two manual harpsichord and these two keyboards have distinct sounds. And so we're showcasing that right off the beginning of the concert with the Bach Italian concerto, which is really one of the preeminent works that kind of features the harpsichord in that way. Yeah. So it, I, we felt it was important to have this presented as a solo instrument, but it's also very much a chamber instrument. And we're presenting this not just in music from the Baroque with great um, compositions by Matthijs and Telemann, um, but also from music in what would be more the kind of the early classical era um, with um, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges and then a 20th century composer in Vittorio Rieti. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we'll hear it as a chamber piece in in uh, a variety of different centuries in different settings, and you'll hear this in a way the the usage of it morph, and you'll see how just how versatile the instrument is. And then we'll end the concert with a piece by um, Heinrich Ignaz Franz von Bieber, the Battaglia, mm -hmm. and this Battaglia is really a small orchestral piece so you'll get to see what Alain was talking mm -hmm. about how 
the harpsichord needs to have this kind of orchestra ability to anchor and power and motor an orchestra. So I think um, people who see this concert will really get to see so many different facets of this amazing instrument. Yeah. Uh, can we talk a little bit about how the harpsichord in general has been used by contemporary composers? Maybe some of the works that you know of or composers that you know of who have used the harpsichord in modern times. Well, not to go back to the guillotine, but the last cut <laughs> from this program uh, <laughs> was a piece that was a huge regret to come out of just an extraordinarily difficult but amazing piece by Sofia Gubaidolina, mm. um, which we need to get back to. Just a great piece. Um, it was a reflection on Bach. And I think I do feel like that using a uh, harpsichord does have a historical connotation to it. Um, and this piece by Gubaidolina is a reflection on a Bach chorale. And it actually re recalls to me a piece that the 419 Festival back in 2019 programmed, a wonderful um, con concerto by Evan Williams, um, Dead White Man Music. Yeah. And it just, that was, that's an amazing piece of music. And it was actually a piece that inspired Alain and I to commission a piece of Evans because he just used the harpsichord so brilliantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. so that, mm -hmm. that those are a couple of pieces that come out, come come to mind off the top. And, and it was a really fascinating piece in that he drew on the music of Baroque era composers mm -hmm. to create his work. And of course, they would have been right at home with the harpsichord. But Absolutely. he mm -hmm. introduces things like blues and jazz mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. into it as well. So it's a fascinating piece. And I think. Though, though they are f different composers, for sure, you can sense the ability to be inspired by, but mm. not beholden to, mm. those past traditions um, with, with Gubaidolina, with Evan Williams. Um, that, that's a very unique and a difficult gift. Uh, it's something that certainly fascinated Alain. It's, a, it's a, like that ability to kind of um, interact with tradition. Mm. Well, one thing about the harpsichord... Uh... Is that you know, like when you smell something and it brings you back uh, to a memory of another time, or you yeah, play something, sure. you hear the sound of the harpsichord. You don't need to write in a mm. in a language that's baroque. You know, if you like, like a nowadays composer, like your contemporaries, when you use the instrument, there's this link that uh, that happens between music that's older, music that's from now, and there's always like it's like the extremes go well together. Uh, the, and the, there's a certain um, economy, uh, like in the composers you were talking, of course, uh, Goubay Durina, Kaya Sariao, uh, th those composers, they really, um, they really use a lot of economy in the, in the, in the writing. And sometimes the harpsichord, just one note brings you to, to, to a special place. So it's very interesting. Yeah. But you were talking about, um, um, 20th century composers. Or 21st century composer. <clears throat> well, in in our season, we have this concert, which which is you know celebrating the instrument. But we also feature, we also feature it in the the masterworks, and we'll we'll come back to that later. But we have a harpsichord concerto the, yeah. the this in year February, I think, huh? yeah. in February, yep. yeah, in our French program. We're we're playing the the, the Poulenc uh, concerto. The the challenge of having harpsichord concertos, and we'll talk about that <laughs> in the, yeah. between now and February. It's it's. Uh, it's the same as a guitar concerto. So you want to be heard through a huge orchestra or a big orchestra. If it's a size, like we have a very good instrument, but you know, like the guitar, you always very lightly have a amplification yeah. for it. It's a, it's a big debate uh, that's been happening uh, places where you have concertos that say, yes, but you know, you should not use that. But at the same time, singers and opera, you know, you know, they, they have the Canon microphone, they call it, you know, from the floor, you yeah. know, <laughs> and the guitars have. So it's, just all things that uh, we have to be flexible and we have to go with the times. The halls were not built to contain uh, 2,000 people back then. Yeah. Yay! Well, I, I hate to interrupt this wonderful discussion, but, you know, priorities. We have a, <laughs> we have a quiz. We, uh -oh. And this is sort of a nonsense quiz. As opposed to... <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to a non-nonsense quiz. <laughs> is this your quiz music? That is the intro quiz music. Okay. We should use that all the time. We're going to do this sort of like, like Jeopardy, you know, where you say, what is a blah, blah, blah. Okay. So answer in the form of a question. Answer so, in the form yeah. of a question. You had a little yeah. bit of a Jeopardy color in this intro. Yeah, so the, 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 yeah I heard it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, well done. Merv Griffin. That was the point. <laughs> is, is, is that the da, da, 
Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, right. Okay, so but we don't have buzzers. I, you don't need a buzzer. You just raise your hand. Everybody <laughs> oh, can see it at home clicks. on the radio. No. <laughs> you can click on your <laughs> click on your pen. It's perfect. We should have an effect of a harpsichord note. Thing. Yeah, exactly. yeah <laughs> we should. The closest thing I have is that right there. But nobody said Mahler. No, yeah, well. uh, you just did. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, w- w- which came first, the Mahler or the Ma Bell? <laughs> <laughs> We have to get yeah. David Dyer back. <laughs> yes, we do. And we will. <laughs> we will indeed. Okay, just five questions in this very easy quiz, the okay. imaginary harpsichord quiz. And, and you get one minute to answer and just throw out your answer. If you know the answer, click your pen, raise your hand, whatever okay. it is, and say it, and we'll see if you're right or wrong. Right. Okay? okay? So I'll give you an example. If I said, this instrument might cut you. The answer would be guillotine. What is? <laughs> oh, I, I, I had musical saw. The answer would be what is a sharpsichord? Ah, get it? Oh, I understand. That's the okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Your first clue. This instrument is found mainly in Europe and Asia, and only plays under fresh water. It's a harpsichord. <laughs> Answering a well, question. That... <laughs> <It's a carpsichord. laughs> totally right. <laughs> I didn't even get to play my music. All right. <laughs> Was that a baby shark uh, about to happen? Yeah, baby shark accord. I yeah. should have thought of that. <laughs> but it plays water music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh no. Only the hornpipe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. You won't get this one. This one is a musical chimera at home in modern Appalachia as it is in Baroque Europe. You have one minute to answer. A musical chimera at home in modern Appalachia, or Appalachia, as it is in Baroque Europe. Oh, wh- what is a juice harpsichord? No, close. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Uh-uh. I'll give you a clue. It's a type of instrument, plus... Well, it's two types of in- instruments laid on top of each other. They share a word in common, which is harp. All right, nobody's going to get it. That was an auto harpsichord. Oh, who's going to say that? Right, an auto harpsichord. Hmm. Okay. This is a very loving instrument. Remember, it has to be some kind of a chord. What is a harpsichord? Oh. Yay! (laughs) All right. So far, Zach and Merwin are tied. Two more questions in this round. Often known to carry people away, this Greek mythology-inspired instrument has wings to fly in the face of a woman. Can I use my lifeline? (laughs) (laughs) Is that your final answer? And this, uh, you know, has to do with Greek mythology. So you think of the... Some kind of Pegasus. Uh, yeah. Fly. Um, uh, Zach, you can do it. You this, can do it. This is gonna. This is gonna kill us. We're gonna... Okay, that was a harpsy accord. Oh. Har- harpy accord. <laughs> a harpy accord. See, this quiz is harder than it, than it sounds, right? Yeah. Okay. So, final question in this round. This instrument doubles as a protective cover. A tarp. What is the tarp's accord? Oh. Whoops. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, what? It was Merwin. Is, did you hit the wrong manual? I, I hit the, <laughs> <laughs> the wrong manual. The wrong keyboard. Okay. Well, Merwin won that round. Wow. Good for you, Merwin. Yay! And some more applause for you there. Uh, we'll go back to another round, but I want to jump back into the classroom with David Dyer where he talks about uh, tuning. We mentioned before that the Tuscan Hubbard harpsichord is, is able to, to change pitches, it's able to transpose. Um, David was very adamant that we learn about the difference between tuning in the Baroque era and as it is today, and he brought in his recorder and demonstrated some of it for us. So, We're going to play that feature now. This is A Brief History of Tuning with David Dyer. One of the important things about our new instrument is that it's transposable. 
So why transposable? Why is that important? Why do we need to transpose? Is this to play in different keys? Irving Berlin had a piano that could play in any key because he basically only knew how to play in one key and so he had a lever that would enable him to play in his home key and have it come out in whatever key he wanted. Is that what this is for? No, that's not what this is for at all. It has nothing to do with that. In different historical periods, the standard A, which we now consider generally 440 vibrations per second, or we can just say 440 hertz because it's shorter, we kind of take it for granted that that's a standard, just like we now take for granted that the time is standard across the world. Uh, just like the time didn't used to be standard until the railroads came in, uh, the pitch didn't used to be standard because everybody had their own pitch in each town. I think a lot of people who do Baroque performance play with an A at 415 vibrations per second, or 415 hertz. So, does this mean that in the Baroque period, everybody was playing at 415 hertz? No, it doesn't. Bach played at pitches anywhere from 392 hertz to about 466 hertz. His organ was probably around 466. And the Renaissance period, pitch tended to be very high. They, they liked brilliant things. Then opera hit around 1600. And the big deal on operas were very, very sad stories. Things got very serious and the pitch just plummeted. So it was all over the place, but generally when you check out recorders of the time, um, a lot of woodwinds at the time, you'll find that generally they're around 412, 415, somewhere in that zone. Let's see, I've got some recorders here. Um, I've got an alto recorder here. Uh, this is one at 440. And here's a recorder with an A at 415 hertz. That's tuning, and, and the great thing about this is that that means that this instrument can be used for, uh, for modern pieces, or it can be used with people who are playing on historical instruments. <laughs> okay, that concludes our lesson for today. <laughs> Interesting, though, about tuning. You, we don't think about that. We did think about it as opera singers. When I was mm. an opera singer, I was thinking, man, I was 100 years too late. I could sing this stuff half step down very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, that one little half step makes all the difference. But um, as far as tuning for this program, I mean, you don't, do you have to do any fancy, switchy, fancy switching of keyboards or anything like that? None. None. None whatsoever. Yeah, it all works. We, we tend to stay at 440 now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the the challenge with this kind of program is that um, you know you need to have the all the instruments at the sure. same pitch. Yeah. So, uh, right. so some are you know, and and also people play the day before and the day after at 440. So uh, and we also need the, the instrument to be to keep the tuning with the orchestra when we need it. So yeah. we can't go 415, 440, 415. Well, I imagine somebody <clears throat> with perfect pitch would be driven crazy by those pitch changes. Well, you know, it's interesting because I mean, I have perfect pitch, and I it drove me crazy at the beginning, like just hearing it because it's exactly a semitone lower 415. Well, almost exactly a semitone per, and. I, when I, you know, I play the trombone, so I, on the sackbutt, which is the, the Baroque trombone, you have a thing that's called a, a pig tail. <laughs> Your sackbutt has a, a big tail? A pig. pig. Oh, a pig yeah. tail. Your oh, sackbutt has a That's one of my, yeah. that's that's one of my favorite children's books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sackbutt the sack with a pig tail. I expect a, a doodle from you, Merwin, by the Any end moment. of the episode. Yeah. So the, the pig tail is actually, you know, you can imagine a pig tail. It goes around. It's a little piece of tubing. You put it between the bell and the slide, and it brings it down to 4, 4, 4 15. Yeah. And what, once I started playing with that, it, when you listen to it, it can be bothering. But when you play an instrument that is actually at 415, 
you sit on that that it's like a warm bath. Mm. It's with bubbles and everything. It's amazing yeah. to play at four, uh, 415. You, you have to wonder, the people that came up with the names for these things, they, <laughs> they must have known, you know. <laughs> hey, let's call it the sack butt. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, no, no. It comes from two old uh, French. Uh, uh, Sacé bouté, to push and pull. Oh, push yeah, and pull. Yeah. Push me, pull me. It's yeah. like that. It sounds it, like a, a, a Baroque a madrigal, a, <laughs> yeah. a Renaissance madrigal that with the, uh, anyway. <laughs> it's like Bati Bati from uh, Don Giovanni, a Mozart, right? Anyway. Well, for, Zach for, is doodling already. I'm, <laughs> we're not going to share that, though. 415 is a beautiful sound. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, if we play uh, 440 the day before. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, a well-tempered clavier. I mean, it's a, it's a solution of compromise. Yeah. yeah. Well, then that's a whole different story, temperament, yeah. right? when we talk about the scales and all that stuff. But we're not going to talk about no. that today. <laughs> hey, you guys know that joke that what's the difference between a harpsichord and a tuna? I mean, oh, I you messed it up already. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and a fish is what I meant to say. Okay, I, 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 start over. We'll we'll, we'll you, do like if we didn't. You know that. You know that uh, joke. What's the difference between a harpsichord and a fish? <laughs> no. <laughs> you okay over there? You can tune a harpsichord, but you can't tune a fish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for coming to my TED talk. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think I give you a little more vibrato. I think we're ready um, for the. Well, you want to say something? I, well, Zach, I just or? want to come in here because I had a fascinating conversation with somebody the other day who said, "I don't understand how a harpsichord works. I know why it sounds different from a piano." And we happened to have the harpsichord down in the symphony space, so I, I took him downstairs. And I, I the, the cover, by the way, is impossible to get off, but. Um, <laughs> You know, Valerie, I'd love for you to talk about the difference in touch and how that differs in how you approach playing the harpsichord versus playing the piano. Oh, where do I begin? <laughs> yeah. you, want, you want some music? Um, background. Okay. Not, yeah. Not, not too loud. Your story late. music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there are just so many huge differences between piano and harpsichord, and and switching between the two can be a bit of a, a shock and a, and a big adjustment as well. Uh, n not the least of which is the fact that a uh, harpsichord has only five octaves, whereas a piano has seven plus octaves, 88 keys on a piano, and I think 61 keys typically on a harpsichord. Um, so it uh, really has its limitations for a harpsichord. Um, no sustaining pedal on a harpsichord. Um, the, the strings are so much more delicate on a harpsichord than on a piano. A uh, piano requires really, really huge, thick strings relative to the harpsichord. And it would be comparing the, the string size between a piano and harpsichord, I would say something like comparing a, a Tim Horton coffee mug to a, a an English fine bone china teacup hmm. <laughs> and, wow. and as a result the, those those strings on a harpsichord are so delicate and easy to break if you come in and use one's piano chops mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you'll have strings popping everywhere not to mention all the the mechanical uh, wood thumping sounds that that come out as well so, so many different uh, limitations, but then also uh, wonderful um, uh, differences in that the harpsichord provides this just amazing, amazing color and texture and uh, outline to the, to the music. So, it's yeah. all just amazing. Yeah. So, the harpsichord, obviously more delicate than the piano, mm -hmm. as you've been talking about. H have you ever had that problem with strings breaking? I mean, you ever had to restring a harpsichord? And I've not had to restring a harpsichord. That's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> there is no dynamic. But a piano. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> but can you tune um, a fish? Uh, okay. <laughs> Zach, you were set up for that one. Uh, Just so uh, easy. <laughs> so easy. You grabbed it. <laughs> anyway, no, I've not had to change a string on a harpsichord. I would not know how to do it. We yeah. would have to call David to yeah. hire. Yeah. I mean, David <laughs> has, has uh, mentioned that he's changed strings on harpsichords very quickly and easily. Yeah. So, um, 
So we it's like that going in mind. into the pit stop, right? You're like, I come back in in 10 measures. Right. <laughs> See if you can change that string in time. <laughs> right. I would say just the difference, you know, if you uh, have ever played a keyboard and it's not turned on and the keyboard doesn't have like weighted keys or anything like that. It's just, uh, you know, the, the keys yeah. go down. Mm-hmm. Uh, some organs are like this too. Um, but that's what the harpsichord is. There, there's no There's no difference in playing it softly or hard it's the same sound yeah. but the 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 tactile response is so different i just find it fascinating right uh that tactile uh sensation on a harpsichord is so so uh fine-tunedly yeah. delicate and um playing on a piano um as as musicians do <clears throat> before they make an entrance <clears throat> they tend to breathe and mm-hmm. you know there's a certain amount of english put on it yeah. as well as the hands which which i use i lift my hands before i before i play and i cannot do that on a harpsichord because mm-hmm. it results in these little ghost notes you know yeah. notes that don't belong there yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. so mm-hmm. yeah very sensitive mm-hmm. We were talking um, to a, a pianist about the difference between playing a modern piano and a forte piano, and, and she said it's the, the the technical demands are so much um, greater on a forte piano. Do you feel that that's another step um, in that direction to go to playing a harpsichord? Um, yes, actually, on a forte piano. Speaking of steps, the knee <laughs> is is engaged in a forte mm-hmm. piano for. For the instruments in which the sustaining pedal is you, controlled by the the knee, the, which is the pedal is located directly yeah. under um, the keyboard. Hmm. So, yes, there's. I never knew that. that oh, yeah. Fun fact about the piano mm-hmm. forte. Yes. Yeah. You got any more yeah. of those? I want to oh, hear. Them. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, the only interesting st- story about yeah. the That's piano. It. Yeah. That's it. That's the end. Yeah. <laughs> that, there's a very basic thing also that is that uh, the harpsichord, the strings are pinched. You know, like like uh, yeah, plucked, they're, they're so like not pinched, plucked. plucked sorry, yeah. right. they're they're plucked like a guitar, right? Mm. And and the piano, mm. well, the strings are hit by a hammer, uh, a, a, you know. So yeah. w- it's like if you have a mini gong, you know, boom. There's a resonance that comes out, and uh, so it's it's a huge difference, right? Because it's how you're going to. Uh, it's like playing <coughs> the guitar. If you play too hard, then that's what you get in trouble, and right. that's why it doesn't sound yeah. beautiful. So. That you don't have a lot of room to maneuver on a harpsichord. For for right. colors, it's really it's exactly what you were saying. You know, you have the the, the hands cannot really leave all that. Yeah. You have to control everything, but it's really about plucking or hitting the the strings. Right, yeah. and I, I want to jump in here to say that also the the harpsichord, the width of the keys on the harpsichord is narrower mm-hmm. than on a piano, and it's a huge <laughs> adjustment. Because yeah. you think about Just, that's an octave on a piano, but. Yeah, yeah. People had so, smaller fingers back then, I guess. You know? <laughs> Shorter doorways, narrower keys. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. And Something short like beds. That. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we should go out on a high note, which means the second half of our quiz, right? Let me pull up the game show music. That was quite the transition musically. <laughs> <laughs> there is such thing as a disco harpsichord, didn't you know that? Yeah, disco harpsichord. Well, jazz harpsichord. Yeah. There's a great jazz harpsichord concerto by uh, Joseph Horowitz. Yeah. Uh, do you know that? No. Oh. <laughs> it's actually know, a lot of fun. I know Joseph Horowitz, yeah. but not the concerto. Uh, and of course, Rosemary Clooney has a syncopated harpsichord in Mambo Italiano. Yeah. Uh, okay, back to the quiz, all right? There are five <laughs> questions. We'll do it very quickly. This instrument can travel through time. What is it? The, what is the TARDIS? The chord? <laughs> Clocks accord? You know, I'm going to give you a Yay! yes for that because I, I originally had a lame answer, time warps accord, but you can say the TARDIS accord. <laughs> I like that better. <laughs> yeah. The, you, if you're you writing guys, in the correct answer? Is that how Merwin always <laughs> <I'm writing laughs> <in. Yeah. laughs> going to honorary point to Merwin there. Yeah. Okay. This one is uh, you don't want to go whale hunting without this instrument. Harpoon is a yeah. <laughs> What is? Yeah. <laughs> Brad, did you just hit every button on your soundboard? <laughs> I did. I was. I was trying to. You know, someday uh, this will be automatic. I, if I ever had to fly a jet, you know, I'd be in trouble because you always see them up there, like clicking all those little buttons. 
Anyway. What is so, a Jets Accord? <laughs> Jets Accord. <laughs> oh, that wasn't a question. Sorry. That was good. Oh, I keep getting that mixed up. Yeah. There we go. So Elaine and Zach and Val, everybody got that one. All right. Okay. You can get both personal advice and a mean gin and tonic from this particular instrument. What is a Bar Keeps Accord? Good enough. <laughs> I give that to you, Zach. I had bars accord and any you know kind of uh, delineation of that word. Okay, only two questions left. This one has a fireplace built in. What is a hearth accord? Oh. Yes, yes. Hey. hearth Brilliant. Brilliant. That was really hard to enunciate through a mask. I'm yeah. not actually <laughs> sure I did it. <laughs> now this last question has several um, possible answers. Zach, if you get this one, then you will, you will have tied with Merwin, okay? Uh, so w- way to go. jinx me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this instrument can only play one note. <laughs> you, well, you in this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> no guesses. What is a viola? (laughs) (laughs) All right, we'll see you next week. (laughs) No, I was looking for anything with sharp in the in the uh, note, like a C sharps accord or a D sharps accord or an F sharps accord. Mm -hmm. So I was leaving it open, and nobody got it. No, well, but none of those are open strings. So, <laughs> Merwin, <laughs> Merwin, you won this round too. So you're the all-time champion for uh, yeah. this or imaginary episode. harpsichord quizzes. <laughs> yes. I can see that. And you get a chocolate from Laura Secord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that might, is that a Canadian joke though? Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 I, I didn't get it. I don't think anybody got it. That's all right though. You can you can drive home on harpsichord. <laughs> oh, oh that's okay, right. good harpsichord. one. Okay. I get it now. <laughs> Any other jokes come to mind? <laughs> we, we'll finish the episode by telling harpsichord jokes. No. <laughs> oh, it's a little early in the week for that. So the concert is happening Sunday. It's October 2nd at 7 o'clock p.m. And at the Toledo Club, all kinds of harpsichord music featuring the new Tuscan Hubbard harpsichord of the Toledo Symphony. You can find more information at toledosymphony.com or at the box office number. Four one nine two four six eight thousand. So excited to get back to Toledo Club for this series. Uh, it's been the most frequent request through the pandemic was to take the chamber music back to Toledo Club. So it'd be yeah. nice to be back there. Everybody just wanted to have an open bar when they. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cash bar, but it's just a beautiful place. You know the the wood paneled walls, the chandelier. There's just something about it that feels very yeah. homey and cozy for a Sunday night. Well, and the harpsichord is a perfect instrument to make its debut in that venue. You know, it, it it's so much of a chamber instrument as we mm-hmm. talked about, and a solo instrument. I imagine it'll be a, a great experience. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony. You can download episodes as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org slash lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony by visiting their website at toledosymphony.com and their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find the TSO's streaming platform online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks to Elaine Trudell, Zach Vasser, Merman Sue, and our special guest, Valerie Kontorski. Also, thank you to David Dyer for his contributions today. I'm Brad Cresswell. This has been Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.